where there's a lot more that goes behind the scenes that people don't see, like prepping an animal, taking care of it, putting food on the table. Um, it's a it's a way of life more than just a activity. Knew the area that I already previous. It's a historical big buck area. That's why it's hard to get a tag. You're gonna okay. see you're gonna see good deer. It's just really hard to get. The hardest part's getting the tag. Mm-hmm. It took me seven years to get that tag. I've been putting in since high school. Apparently, it, I don't know much about hogs, but the guy told me that that's probably the biggest one they've shot off their their place. And they've shot hundreds, so I got uh, really really lucky with that one. It's just one of those. It's my hunter instinct. If it gets you, it's like buck fever. If you get buck fever, then that is something that if you lose that, you shouldn't be hunting anymore. If we have a lot of sportsmen out there and people that care about it, this heritage is not going to go away. It's going to get bigger and more knowledgeable, so to speak. Yeah. And uh, there just has to be a forefront of that knowledge to pass on. So so, long story short, I used to be a professional athlete. um, And then I, you know, got injured and retired or got released or whatever so i couldn't play anymore and i picked up uh the outdoors as my next greatest love so i decided to figure out how i can make money at being uh in the outdoors no matter what it took so a lot of adventures between then that that goal and dream and it becoming a reality not that long ago okay nice and so when you say that you were an athlete, I'm like super into baseball. I saw that you were drafted by the Braves. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. That's After incredible. That college, uh, played three years, just didn't have what it took, I guess. Um, body wouldn't hold up. Uh, you know, old old injuries just would linger, and I couldn't perform at the highest level. Like I, I you know, maybe doing some different things, taking care of my body when I was younger. Uh, would have helped for sure but I didn't take care of my body enough and in turn you know just wore down sure sure absolutely so with you like playing in like the minors and things like that did you still have time for like the outdoors yeah so I I mean I we would be done playing uh in the end of September so I would be able to go in the woods in October November but training would be you know I would have to stay on my training and so you couldn't really take off, take off, but you could do definitely trips and stuff. But uh, um, then December would hit, I'd be full form and uh, training and whatnot. So it was, uh, you know, I couldn't do everything I wanted to do. So I pretty much got two free months to myself in the fall, and that was pretty much it. Jeez. You had to make them so, count, huh? Yeah, I had to make them count. Jeez, Wow. So, uh, yeah, you did the baseball thing and then, um, I was kind of reading on your stuff. That's kind of why you went towards the name, the void. Is that, is that right? Yes. Cause you were trying to fill, I'll let you explain it a little bit better than probably I could. Yeah. So my, so I'm going to be launching a YouTube series, uh, in correlation with, um, vector arrows and it, it's in a, a big working process right now. Um, basically the reason I came up with the name, the void is because, us as people and daily hustle and bustle lives are trying to basically fill a void of some sort, whether it be going, getting away from work, whether it be um, just their wife, their kids, or they're, they're just whatever their daily life, they try and fill that void with either the outdoor, something hunting related, fishing related, or anything like that. So it's, um, that's how I came up with my ideas just because I, I've been, Basically, I'm filling my void of baseball and having that out of my life with the outdoors. So that I fill that void every day by some type of outdoor related um, activity, which kind of makes me go through my life a lot, you know, more happy and smooth. And it's something to look forward to every day. Sure. Absolutely. Do you feel like the like you had baseball obviously, and then now you, you want to do it with like hunting and things like that. Do you feel like it fills the void the same? Uh, yes, I think, uh, I, at this point, I think it was more my calling, so to speak. Um, you know, you, everybody changes a little bit different throughout their life, but I think the outdoors and the hunting, um, is it's been in my life since I've been 
three years old growing up. So it's, I think it's more my calling than baseball was at the time I thought baseball was definitely my calling, but this could be mine. Um, you don't know until it actually happens. Yeah. So, um, so to speak that it definitely is outdoors is my life now. Yeah. That's awesome. That's super cool. I like that. That's a good name for it too. That's awesome. Yeah. It's going to be, going to be some pretty cool stuff coming out. I got a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that I've been posting about years past. I mean, I got a lot of it on film and I'm going to come out with some short stories, some segments, a little bit of this and that, some talks. I mean, whatever I had filmed, I'm going to throw episodes out and I'm going to try filling the gaps with storytelling as best as I could. Yeah, that's awesome. You got a date for that? Like when you're going to start dropping that? Um, Probably in August. Okay. Maybe maybe the end of July if I can get some stuff um, prepped in time. Being a one-man team is is the hard part. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I'm sure you're starting to become an expert in everything though, right? Videography, yeah. editing, and everything else. Yeah, I do a lot of video work. I'm uh, getting better at the editing part. Like I'm more of a, I'm a better videographer and photographer than I am an editor. So I, I know how to produce a show and everything. I just, I'm not a very good uh, editor yet. I'm getting there. That's just a slow process that I don't like sitting on a computer. So I got to just knuckle down and do it, but I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I kind of notice exactly what you're saying too, because like kind of scrolling through your Instagram, like your whole Instagram has like a vibe to it. You know what I mean? Like there's not like one picture like out of place. Like you can tell that you're like very strategic about like the things yeah. that you post. Like everything has like kind of like a theme that relates to you a little bit. You know? Yeah, and it's all a, a lot of a lot of people in this industry are just hunting or fishing or whatever they want to try and do with their life. Uh, they try and do things out of their ordinary that they don't, it's not them. I try to do things at a professional grade level, but it's still what I do and who I am. Sure. And I do have strategy behind why I do things. And, and it's a lot to do with reading into socials and platforms and why something's trending why something's not there's a lot of science begin you know not there's a lot of background information on why things are the way they are and uh that's actually why i took a position not that long ago to run people's and companies socials is because i understand how that stuff works that's basically cool. gr growing organic pathways you know having organic growth and not just paying you know, a giant media company to just blast ads and nobody wants to follow a company that just blasting ads. Yeah, I definitely agree, man. That's cool that you have that background knowledge in that. I just learned it over the years of trial and error. It's basically been a three, four year quest to learn all that stuff that I've picked up over time. So that's cool, man. That's awesome. So I guess like kind of backtracking a yeah. little bit, you, you said that you've been, uh, you've been hunting and stuff since you were three. Can you tell us how you got started in in hunting man my whole family hunts we are a giant um hunting family my dad was basically my mentor growing up um he's a taxidermist for the past 40 years and counting so oh, nice i basically grew up around dead animals and the outdoor culture and you know the sportsman culture i should say because i pride myself as a sportsman and not just a hunter um, cause a hunter is a bad name, uh, that people give themselves or killer, so to speak, where there's a lot more that goes behind the scenes that people don't see, like prepping an animal, taking care of it, putting food on the table. Um, it's a, it's a way of life more than just a activity. Sure. Absolutely. That's well said. So that's, I, I would, I would much more prefer people to pride themselves on being an outdoorsman and a sportsman and a conservationist than just somebody that just i hunt it right. doesn't sound good to the public that joe q public that doesn't have any idea what hunting's all about mm -hmm. yeah absolutely that's great again well yeah. said yeah, that's cool so like you said that like you were grew up, you grew up around it your dad's a taxidermist do you like butcher your your own deer and stuff and things like that too yep I do it all myself. I don't, uh, there's not one process, not one step that I have anybody else do besides, um, I'll take some already cured 
meat and maybe take it to a uh, butcher shop to maybe make like some bologna or something like that. But other than that, I do everything myself. That's cool, man. That's impressive. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. So I was kind of scrolling through uh, your page a little bit, and I'm not sure if this is going to trigger a memory for you or not, but you have a huge eight point on there with huge G twos. And uh, do you know what I'm talking about? The real wide one. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. If you could tell us a story about that, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So uh, basically it's beginning of November. Um, I'm hunting. I only hunt public ground um, in Pennsylvania here besides maybe two days a year tops. Uh, but I, focus and concentrate all on public ground so i was hunting an area for a couple of days to a week um that was before i really got into cell cameras or trail cameras or any any type of really detailed scouting um i got in to an area i was hunting and i missed a really big buck the night before and i basically thought i blew my chances i, I was like that was it I, I blew my chance you know had a really big one this year. So I decided to try somewhere else. Um, Cause I thought I just blew him out of the area and he's not gonna, you know, come back. So I tried another spot and I set up, I found, and on the way in, I found a big scrape line. And I was like, well, I'm just gonna set up here for this evening uh, and see what I see. And I didn't see a single deer all that evening. Um, the, the scrapes, there was four of them that were super fresh. So I came back the next morning and, uh, I rattled in a smaller buck right underneath my tree stand. I seen two does. I almost shot the doe and, uh, right whenever I had my bow in my hand about to shoot the doe, I looked towards the scrapes and that deer was trotting down the, the trail I already marked. Um, and he was going to pass me at like 52 yards, but I already met, I already pre-ranged it. So I just drew back. And when he, when he got close to that opening, I just stopped him and he stopped for just long enough that I squeezed off. And I mean, I, I hit him a little touch back, but he wheeled and went back, um, the way he came, which kind of scared me. So I had to do a big loop when I got down, I didn't even check the arrow. I didn't check the blood. I knew I hit him. Yeah, I knew I hit him decent just from the impact, the way he reacted, the whole nine yards. Um, no, I did get down. I did check that. I did check for blood. As soon as I got to the point of impact, I found blood hmm. and uh, I did not find my arrow. Um, so I, I knew it stuck in him. So I went big mile and a half loop back to my truck, called my dad. He came up the uh, up to the truck. And on the way up, he found a big hoof print in the dirt um, on the road where it, we think it's the same deer crossing the road and where it came from. Okay. So we just waited like five or six hours. And then I had, instead of busting brush the way I came out, I went in the trail system that I, I went into the, my stand. Okay. And on the way in, I actually found him laying 80 yards from where, like, where i seen him so he only went like maybe 100 yards Jeez, was that's incredible. Up. so i actually found him like without doing the whole blood trail or it was kind of uh, you know surreal he ended up being like 148 inch eight point uh, 24 inches wide and i thought he was a 10 when i shot because it always it happened so fast that i didn't have time to grab my range finder my binoculars check what he was i just knew he was a really good deer yeah. And my adrenaline got pumping enough that I had to let one fly and hit him good. And he only went a hundred yards. Jeez. You said this was in PA? Yes. Nice. Yes. Is that like a typical, I've never been over there. Is that like a typical PA deer? Um, not typical. Um, it's a lot of the caliber I'd shoot is probably above average, if not the high grade. Um, but it's definitely a not a typical thing for our area. Typically, you get a hundred and fifteen to one hundred and ten inch eight point. Is a two and a half year old deer is typical. I got you. Okay, yeah. nice. That's cool. So, like, a, did you? I know you said that it was kind of. Did you have them like on trail cameras and things like that? I know you said you just moved to a new area. 
but like no i i was when i first started running trail cameras i had different bucks i never hunted this area it was one of those like i i, I wanted to check it out i got pretty much locked into them um i knew traditionally that there was always good at, good deer hanging out in that area just from pressure getting away from people i know yeah. how to get away from guys uh, and for hunt sign and that's kind of that would probably be the buck that got me more addicted to it so to speak that was my my year that really set in stone like this is like what i'm going to be doing yeah i get i get what you're saying that's awesome so yeah. like out there hunting i know you said you do primarily uh public land do you run into a lot of people out there oh yeah i run into a lot of guys everywhere um i just your sign to go deeper uh yeah so it, it, there's a lot of details that go into that like i figure out where guys go and where guys don't go and i go where guys don't go pretty much i got um, you i just don't like running into people it happens i mean it's public ground it's your ground it's my ground it's everybody's i mean everybody pays for it and it's in a way um through taxation and different you know it's federal land it's everybody's but i just i don't like running into guys i'd mm -hmm. rather not but that's the nature of the beast when you're on public ground. I run into people riding horses before, riding bikes, hiking. I mean, you name it. And I'm, a, you know, got a lot of hunts ruined because of it. But I'm just glad to see some people out there, you know, enjoying the outdoors and stuff. So it's you got to kind of think with a greater mind when those situations come. So it's yeah. one of those ordeals. So I've heard of people like running by like that or anything else and they say that it ruins the hunt but then i've also heard people say just wait it out and then possibly you know something else what, what's your experience yeah. with that uh depends where you're at it's all situational things uh, i i've had people ruin it and i that was it um i've had people help me um, by bumping deer basically towards me right but in a general sense it's kind of like a it's a 50 50 shot that could either help you or it could hurt you. I got you. All right. So, so kind of going back to that buck, like how do you determine whether something's a shooter or not? Like, how do you know, if, Hey, that's the buck I want to take. For me personally, um, truth be told, if it, if it's probably not 140 inch deer better, it's not going to get me pumping. Okay. Um, but my, basically my shooter would be, it's a mature deer. That's number one. Number two, it's something that has a story for me or something that gets me excited. If it doesn't get me excited, then that, you know, that's not something I want to take its life because it doesn't seem fair to me. True. Um, it's just one of those, it's my hunter instinct. If it gets you, it's like buck fever. If you get buck fever, then that is something that if you lose that, you shouldn't be hunting anymore. Yeah, absolutely. So I just, what gets me excited is what a shooter is for me. That's a good one. I like that explanation. That's good. So what's your uh, public land setup look like? Like, are you using climbers, tree stands, saddles? I'm a saddle guy. Um, okay. I've been a saddle guy for a few years now. Um, I'm a run and gun, hot sign, saddle, saddle guy. I mean, it's, it's becoming very popular, um, but I've, with the way I, my style with, I go in some nasty stuff. I don't want to be carrying tree stands. I'm not, I just, it, it's my simplest. It's the most simple way I can get up a tree and hunt where I want to hunt. Yeah, for sure. The saddle is for me. What kind of saddle are you running? Uh, I run a cruiser XC. Okay. Nice. Um, they're, they're newer. They just came out last year. Mm -hmm. It's the most comfortable saddle I've ever sat in. Uh, I've sat in a couple different ones. But it, it is it doesn't have hip pinch. Uh, it's it's pretty legit. They yeah. let this that stuff do the talking for it. So yeah, that's got that like expandable mesh on there, so it sits a yeah. little bit more comfortably, right? Yeah, it sits a little bit higher on your back and a little bit lower on your legs. Um, so it doesn't doesn't just ride in one position, mm -hmm. and it, it's more like a hammock style around your body. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, I got that same saddle and the first one that I got was the tethered one. And I had that same hip pinch that you were talking about. And it, yep. like, I couldn't sit in it past like more than two hours. Cause it, yes. just, it was brutal. Tethered, they, they are a great company that markets really well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's better products out there, so to speak. I mean, they got, they do got some great products. Like their sticks are 
top of the world, but they just, they got hit pinch for some people, some people they don't. So it's all personal preference. Sure. It's just like some people rock Nike shoes and some people rock Under Armour. Both companies are great. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good point. I mean, so it's not one's not better than the other. It's just, it's all on, you got to know what you like. Yeah. That's a good one. What, what kind of sticks are you running? Uh, I have Novix 18 inch sticks. They're a one piece, solid one piece stick that's stackable. There's four of them and I can get probably about 25, 27 feet off the ground with eighters. Wow. That's awesome. So I, uh, I got it figured out. It's really light, mobile, carry the sticks in my backpack. I'm ready to roll. That's awesome. Yeah. That was going to be my next question is how are you carrying all this stuff out of here? But it sounds like you got a system for that too. Yep. I do. Yeah. And then like with you, uh, like you film too, right? Yep. Yep. Everything I, everything you've ever seen me post, I have it on film. Um, so a lot of that stuff is going to be coming out. I actually have a lot of good deer cause I couldn't get it on film. So filming has been my number one priority. Uh, so it's going to still be my number one priority moving forward. I got a lot of hunts coming up throughout this fall into winter. I uh, out a couple elk hunts, some mule deer hunts. I'm heading to Africa in August. I got a lot of stuff coming down. That's incredible. So it's going to be really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so um, I think the next question that I had, um, you went on a hog hunt here recently? Yeah. How, how was that? It was my first ever experience with that. Uh, a night hog hunt that I shot with a thermal. Um, basically, they were coming in to feed, but the, in Texas, they're – it's so thick and nasty and remote that it's very hard to pattern them. So you basically got to use trail cameras and prior knowledge or just, you know, using your thermals to see thousands of yards down the lanes and try and stock in on them. It's kind of nerve wracking because you can't see anything at night. And I mean, it's, it's different, but at the same time, it was really fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I saw the one that you shot. That thing's a monster. That thing's huge. Dude, apparently, it, I don't know much about hogs, but the guy told me that that's probably the biggest one they've shot off their, their place, and they've shot hundreds. So I got uh, really, really lucky with that one. And you guys are doing this all at night, right? Yeah. I can't imagine that. That would – Yes. That's, that's so I, I hit them. I hit them good. I only got one shot off on them. Hit them good, and I had to track them, actually. Tried to track them. There was not much blood. And you're going through the manzanita and you're going through cactus and nasty stuff, trying to track this animal that's potentially wounded or hurt, or you don't know if he's down yet. Yeah. With a flashlight and can't see more than 10 feet in front of you. And I, I actually heard him rustling and I used the thermal again and I could see him. So I put another round or two in him just to make sure he was down. And it was definitely uh, the hair on the back of my neck was standing up for that one. I can only imagine. And I was, I was thinking too, I was like, there's no way that that thing went down with one shot. Like that thing's incredible. I hit him good too, man. I, I took out his front shoulders, got, got both lungs, but he was still, I mean, those animals are, they have a willingness to live. Yeah, for sure. Would you, would you go back and do that again? Probably. Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. It's, it's a, it's a definitely a fun, got to do it at least once thing. Sure. Sure. I can imagine. Yeah. That's, that's awesome, man. That's super uh, cool. I'll just take you down memory lane. One, one last time. This is the last story that I'll, I'll ask for, but you went out West and uh, you killed a gnarly uh, mule deer. It was, it's insane. I think you said you went out there with your dad and your buddy. Yep. So that was a once in a lifetime, pretty much hunt. Um, really hard tag to draw. It took a quite a few years to gain enough points to hunt it. Uh, you know, I, I actually ended up harvesting him on day two of the season because I, I plan on being there for like 10 days, but I couldn't pass him up. Um, I shot him at like 10,300 feet. It's that early season September hunt in Wyoming. Um, you know, I, I seen a lot of big bucks scouting before that, but that I, I came up over a rise on the way into a basin that I wanted to get to, and he was at 75 yards feeding with three other bucks so i just picked out the best one and uh dropped him in a spot but i mean 
it was really it, that that hunt to me was really memorable because my dad was there he got to come over and get the recovery watch it because he heard me shoot he was only a couple hundred yards behind me yeah my buddy watched me shoot him right beside me um he missed the shot on film or i lost the film somewhere like we don't i can't figure it out we have a lot of film besides like the shot and i don't know what happened I, I asked him if he was on him i don't know if he didn't hit record yeah just can't find the clips anywhere dang it so i still gotta look for i'm gonna look a couple more places for it but mm -hmm. other than that it was four mile hike out with a bunch of meat in your back in the middle of you know nowhere wyoming with your dad and good buddy so i i couldn't couldn't be more blessed for that one that's awesome so you guys you guys just kind of you drew the tag and then you just guys went out there and scouted and just ended up buying yeah I, I knew the area that i already previous it's a historical big buck area that's why it's hard to get a tag you're gonna okay. see you're gonna see good deer it's just really hard to get the hardest part is getting the tag mm -hmm. it took me seven years to get that tag i've been putting in since high school jeez so I had to gain enough points and then finally, finally drew it with my dad. And my dad actually shot another really good buck a couple of days later. Um, I actually, I think, I think I might, I'm probably going to post a picture of that one here soon now that I, I think about it. Okay. Um, he shot a really good deer. So that his was better than mine. Jeez. I can't so, even imagine that. I, wow. I didn't get to, I didn't get to see him hunt that cause I was filming for a company there. So I, you know, he shot that almost two weeks later. Okay. All right. But Jeez, that's incredible. Yeah. That, uh, that entire story whole write up is in, uh, MDF's fall issue magazine. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah. That'll be a good read. My uncle being the director of the Mildred foundation. He also shot a buck. I shot a buck, buck all in the same drainage as a family. So it's a good write up showing the historical areas and, it's just it's a good story yeah i'm gonna have to check that out yeah for sure what what's your thought of uh the draw over there because like obviously like you know over in the midwest or maybe out east like you can just go get an over-the-counter tag like no big deal you know yeah no you, for western states you have to have that draw system they don't have the carrying capacity for their herds and um having a free-for-all just oh, there's too many people and not enough animals um sure sure so they can't be high graded there's a lot of studies behind that and that's what's going on right now in the western conservancy and a lot of different states they're studying the, the basically the migration pass and the effectiveness of, of taking certain animals and whatnot so um i just it's something that has to be done there's, i have all four sciences and if science proves that something needs to be done then it has to be done no matter if we like it or not mm. Yeah, I, I was, uh, I lived in New Mexico for like four years and every year I put in for the draw and I thought for sure, I was like, oh, I'll just, like it'll happen. Yeah. And I, I just did not get lucky enough to get anything. That's another state that it's just, they don't have enough. I mean, you see deer, but not a lot, mm -hmm. They're not everywhere. So you can't have just everybody going out there trying to kill one because then there won't be any left. That's true. So. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get what you're saying. You explained it perfectly, but yeah, it's just frustrating some years when you don't, when you don't get something, yeah, you know, I, you know I, I do multiple States, multiple, I try and plan three, four, five years ahead. And ultimately you'll be able to draw a tag in a different state every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, I, I appreciate this, man. This, this was, this was incredible talking with you. It really seems like you have like that sportsman's ethic and you know, I think this was, this was awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. That's, that's one thing I hope to pass on through anybody. Um, it's just that sportsman mentality. Try it. If we have a lot of sportsmen out there and people that care about it, this heritage is not going to go away. It's going to get bigger and more knowledgeable, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh, there just has to be a forefront of that knowledge to pass on. So for sure. Absolutely. Uh, do, do you want to give a quick plug uh, for some of your stuff real quick so people can find you? Oh, yeah. It's just my name, Jake Belinda. Um, it's pretty much uh, my Instagram, Facebook is the exact same. Um, and then The Void is going to be my YouTube and other Instagram profiles that I run all the content through. I think my TikTok is the exact same too, Jake right. Belinda. So 
I, I don't put a lot of hunt stuff on TikTok because you get banned. Um, oh, try really? to make cool stuff. Yeah, I got I get banned all the time. But if you show any wounded animal or any hunting stuff, guns, you just a lot a lot of stuff you got to be careful with. So I just try and follow the rules, and not not get banned. Yeah, for sure. But, well, again, man, I appreciate it, and uh, best of yeah. luck through this hunting season. Yeah, I appreciate it, man.